Hello and welcome to a new season of Fort Worth Forward. Thank you for joining us for what is going to be an exciting episode here at Archie's Garden Land just off Camp Bowie West. Let's go. And now I'm joined by Randall Archie who is owner of Archie's Garden Land here on the west side of Fort Worth. Welcome Randall. Thank you Michael. Great to see you. Great to see you too. So this is a family owned business. Mm -hmm. I think been around for how many years? So 89 since 1934. 89 years yes and so who started it what my what, great grandfather great yeah. grandfather started this I'm the fourth generation fourth generation this it's a it's amazing little pocket over here of West Fort Worth that I think people don't some people don't know about and discover it and so right. tell us that story how did your grandfather decide he was going to get into this business do you know that or great-grandfather well yes yeah, so they specialized in planting large trees where they would go out field dig like a specimen live oak and bring it into um, properties that we're working on building here in the Metroplex. Um, from there, you know, it slowly started to evolve with a brick and mortar, I believe around 52. Okay. Uh, and moved to this location here on the west side of Camp Bowie in 56. 56. Yes. And so when did you get involved with the business? I've been... Since birth? Yeah, pretty <laughs> much. I've been here quite a bit. Many weekends spent here you know, at the garden center for sure. Um, so I've been doing this full time now for close to two decades, I'd say. Okay. Yeah. And your family still involved? You're very much yeah. so. Yeah. My, uh, my father's super involved. My wife's up here working with me just about every day. Uh, my mom and aunts are heavily involved, you know, and, uh, it's, it's a fun dynamic for sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's January and yes. so we're, we're sort of in a slow period maybe, right? Right. So we talked to that we're sitting in one of your greenhouses here where you're host, you're having the plants mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. eventually you'll get to the point where you put them outside. And what, tell us as, as what's sort of the process that you go through here uh, sure. with people and, and, and um, when do people kind of start getting into the, the gardening? When is that, what does that look like? Sure. So right now it's kind of the calm before the storm. Sure. We'll, we'll use January and February to, you know, really just kind of work on planning what this spring is going to look like for us and you know kind of future cast uh, with that we will you know line up a bunch of bookings of shrubbery uh, you know and get ready for the what we call kind of the flood of plant material coming in um, it's it's a lot of back and forth if we have a nice weekend we'll roll a lot of this plant material from these greenhouses that we're sitting in now out to the outdoor retail right. uh, while being vigilant and watching the weather uh, really quickly we'll have another cold front and that comes right back in. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a lot of back and forth um, while preparing for what kind of space we need for mid-February. That's when we'll really start to stock up heavy and then come March it will be full throttle. Yeah, right. seven days a week. Full, save it, seven days a week as people get prepared. I guess there's a planting culture here, a grain yes. culture. What is that like yeah. for you? Well, we're fortunate. I think a lot of you know, our fans and customers are extremely loyal, but they're also really focused on having a good curb appeal or, you know, their indoor houseplants they want, you know, always looking the best. So really blessed to have an audience that, you know, is seasonally attracted to coming in and shopping us. Um, with that, you've, you've got the crazy North Texas weather and it can throw yeah. us some certain curveballs and beat up our plant materials. So. Yeah. We're either replacing things or adding things. I don't know about you, but if something at my house stays for, you know, about 10 years worth of, you know, somewhat stagnant and hasn't changed or been repainted, me and my wife are, are doing that. We're changing right. it. So right. it's always evolving. Yeah. With people like that. Well, we've done a lot. I'll say it kind of fits into that culture. I think we've done a lot at the city with open spaces and yes. investing money in open spaces. Right. And um, I know you're involved in a lot of different organizations mm -hmm. too. Uh, Camp Bowie District being one of them. Yes. Um, give us a little bit about that, what you, you think about um, from the business perspective of running a business, what sure. that means for you here as a business. You bet. Well, recently, um, past four, five years, you know, being involved with the Camp Bowie District, mm -hmm. I've seen it evolve and change it really in a positive light. Uh, the Camp Bowie District's focus on, you know, beautification was kind of phase one or pillar one and 
it helps you know kind of create an environment that seems more retail friendly and it really is once you you know begin to explore off the bricks and uh, you know see some of these small businesses where we can compete and offer something different uh, Camp Bowie district has really helped improve that and it's it's nice to see and get to witness firsthand you know driving up and down the boulevard every day that's yeah for sure yeah well that that that's part of that how has and you kind of answered that a little bit, but how's it contributed to the garden center itself being a part of that? Sure, um, we'll have folks that you know maybe pass by like the red yuccas when they're in full bloom, or right. maybe the the pink muley grass to go with a real you know kind of physical approach to that. They'll That's come the in beautification with, part that you're bringing up on Kentucky yes. Boulevard, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. They'll come in with a photo from the median plantings that I recognize, um, you know, pretty quickly, and say, you know, what's this beautiful grass? Yeah. Um, Along with that, I think it just encourages. So it's good marketing for you as part of that, right? right? That people yeah. see that and go, "Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I want to. I want that for my own place." Yeah, and I think it kind of sparks, you know, other local shops too to maybe step up their curb appeal. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and it it definitely permeates. People through. like pretty things. Yes, <laughs> constantly. <laughs> well, I get that. I get that too. Do you have, you know, worked here for a long period of time? Some sort of outstanding moment or moments that you you would be cool to talk about? You bet, yeah. Um, hard to really, you know, compare what it's like being able to work so close with your family, you know, every day. Um, Sometimes you want to strangle them, probably though. It's it's certainly tough. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in a retail environment. My too, wife wants to strangle me all the time. But we don't even work together. So that's different. But <laughs> yes, it's tough. But it's you know, I think that's real rewarding to be able to work retail. You know, you get to talk to anyone and everyone from every single neighborhood and. Really quickly, when you add plant material or landscape discussions or talking about a vegetable garden, um, you you dive into a personal connection. Uh, and I've got so many customers that, you know, I'll see out and about while I'm getting groceries, um, and we'll talk about how their perennial bed's doing, or you know, different things that we've helped them with, or even seeing a tree that we planted, you know, two decades ago at a local school, and to see it finally giving shade to some kiddos. That's um, cool. That's pretty fun to, you know, here's where I'd add something cheesy and say, you know, we're, we're planting memories. Uh, but sure, it is really yeah. fun to kind of see a tangible, actual plant doing well. Well, I think it's fun. Uh, our old house, I, as you just uh, talked about that story, when I first gr growing up, my dad planted an anniversary tree. Oh, cool. With he and my mom, they're divorced now, so maybe they didn't work out so well. <laughs> but we, we watched tree, it grow tree. as I still drive, drive through right. the neighborhood and see it. So yes. that is that is true. You, you're, you're really planting sometimes for tomorrow. It is pretty neat, yeah. We found an old receipt on the wall. My brother actually found it on the wall of a uh, small museum at the Dallas Arboretum uh -huh. that was signed by my great granddad, and I forget the date, but they That's had. Cool. Yeah. They had transplanted a bald cypress back in like the late 30s. Okay. Uh, all the way to the Dallas Arboretum. And to find a cypress here locally, uh -huh. knowing that they had to camp out on a job site, you know, and probably somewhere down in South Texas, dig this thing and bring it up. Right. Very big feat. Yeah. That be, is great. It's still tough. there at the Arboretum? It's still there. Yeah. It's a great legacy. Pretty great cool. Legacy. Yeah. So I've read, and you and, I have, you and I haven't talked about it, and I wanted to throw this. You're, you've created an atmosphere here. Yes. And now you want to bring a restaurant in. Uh -huh. So yeah. tell us about that. Kevin Martinez <laughs> is a great friend of mine with Tokyo Cafe. Yes. So I'm, I'm excited about this. Tell our tell our viewers what's going to happen here. Sure. So coming in March, we're going to have um, Heirloom. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a garden fresh bistro cafe and mainly soups, salads, uh, sandwiches, and everything that's tied together with a you know very fresh and aspect where we can team together a recipe that we'll be able to give to the customer of Heirloom uh, with an option of, you know, maybe a plant material here that we could grow as well. Wow. So if it was real, like, you know, a strong pesto kind of break down the ingredients and how they could grow it back home. Wow. That be is an yeah. interesting concept. How did that come together with you and, and Kevin? So Kevin and has... Are there any other partners that I'm not mentioning? Is there... Yeah, sure. Yeah, Jerry yeah. and uh, Mary Ho. Okay, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah Jerry and Mary. From Tokyo, Tokyo Cafe. Cafe. And yeah. along with uh, Kevin Martinez. I shared with them the uh, kind of our desire to bring food in, which has always been my granddad's yeah. uh, dream to bring food in here. And now finally being able to, you know, to move on it and, sure. and grow on that opportunity. Execute uh, on a great idea. They really yeah. quickly, you know, yeah. the three of them said, let's do it. And okay. now we're kind of along for the ride and holding on and yeah. it's going to be a lot of fun. That's great. Yeah. So March, March 2023 yes. is what we're talking about. Yeah. 
Okay. It'll well, be uh, Heirloom Fort Worth on Heirloom Fort Instagram. Worth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's, um, it's a great concept too, about giving a recipe and here's what you can do to yeah. grow it at home. Hadn't, yes. hadn't really thought about that. It's kind of fun. So we've done a big focus as, uh, on small businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally invested a lot of time as a small business owner myself, sure. making sure that we as the city are doing the right thing through our permitting process, through any other incentives that we can give mm -hmm. to grow small businesses. Cause I know that they are really the, the staple of, of America and right. Main Street. We talk yeah. about that as a thing, but re it's really true. You're a small business owner. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what that's like, what you go through, and what advice you would have to other small business owners. You've, you've obviously been in operation for a long period of time doing mm -hmm. something well, but I know you have your challenges just like anybody else. So. Sure, yeah, I think challenges, you know, they, they come up daily. So. Um, with, you know, retail sales, I think you are, you're always in competition with a very saturated social media market sure. and a saturated schedule. No one seems to really have free time anymore, you know, <laughs> with its, with kids and- I and don't, just, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, everything. <laughs> so I think uh, some advice I could give would be, you've got to create an environment that folks plan to make time for, mm -hmm. you know, and come to, um, and that's, that's tricky. That's changing things up. Uh, we'll try not to leave a display or an end cap sitting for longer than like a week and a half, mm -hmm. knowing that that repeat customer has something new to see, um, you know, is really helps them come in, you know, more, I feel. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's tough and knowing that it's going to be tough is so marketing, is getting your name out there, letting right. people know you exist. Yeah. Those are obviously challenges for a small business. Yes. What about just the the staffing back back of house? Do I mean how right. how have you worked through that? So we are very fortunate right now to have probably one of the best teams we've had going forward into this spring, and it's it's been a it's been a good curve up in growth. Um, when you've got somebody good, you've got one to let them know that, and two, you've got to spoil them a little bit um, because we you know we couldn't do this without a any of our teams. So really focusing on them while trying to keep things fun and fresh, not just for the customer, but also for my staff uh, is, is one of our goals while it's tough. Yeah. We're at, I think, uh, 36 full-time employees uh, and most retail garden centers don't operate with, with that many folks um, to a degree. So it really helps but yours us. is customer service oriented yes. focus. So it's yeah. important to have that those yeah, people. everything from the you know unloading and processing team to the final sales team, um, we've got a really great crew, and keeping that you know team element is huge. Great. Yeah. Well, with any business, that's important. Taking care of the people that are taking care of you, right? For sure. Well, we joked earlier that we we're in a live greenhouse, so there were drops that were coming out of that <laughs> as part of it. So yes. that's proof to the audience that we are li li yes. literally sitting in one of your greenhouses. Yes. I love yeah. it. I love the authentic authenticity there. So, but Randall, Thank thanks you. for being with us today. Of Thank course. you for telling us a little bit about your story and, and appreciate all that you do. Thanks for sharing your time with us, Michael. Thank you. Great thanks. to see you. Great. Now I'm here with Lauren Anton, who is the executive director of Saving Hope Animal Rescue. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you. How Glad are you to be today? Here. Great. Well, I'm not going to start off this and be awkward and not introduce the other person. Who is who? Who did you bring today? This is Frisco. He's hey, a little Frisco. scared from the drive over, but L he's super sweet. Super sweet. And how did you? How did he come to to be with you? Well, one of our volunteers, the mother and her babies were all being euthanized, and so we went in and took them in. And mom's been adopted, and most of the siblings have been adopted. He's still available, so. Okay, well that's good to know. For people that don't know Saving Hope Animal Rescue, how did you get started? What did you do? How, what do you do on a regular basis? Well, I started as a board member on the foundation board, which is Saving Hope Foundation. And, and that was started by Kit and Gloria yes, Moncrief? Yes, yes. Okay. And that was probably in 2000. It's been at least 15 years, Wow. I think, since the dog was found and that foundation was started. And then we were meeting with the city, meeting with the Humane Society, Spay and Neuter Network, TCAP, uh, a lot of nonprofits, and I started seeing the need, and I offered to foster, mm -hmm. and then friends started to foster, and then we started pulling a lot of animals, and we've saved over 6,000 since 2017. Wow. Wow. Yes. So then we started our own 501. Okay. Because the foundation is now focusing on spay and neuter mainly and okay. education throughout the schools. Okay. So, so. The, what your executive director is, is is on rescuing these animals yes. so they're not euthanized or right. 
and I'm still a board member, but I, my focus, I mean, I'm on my phone or somewhere 10 to 14 hours a day, probably. Trying to find homes or place these animals? All or? of it. So okay. it, even if it means going into the shelter, picking 10 okay. or how many ever, like some groups say, can we do this and go to the shelter and save 15 like we did last right. time? And then we have to find fosters. We have to make sure they're vaccinated, washed, tagged, collared. Right. Then for the fosters, provide food. We provide everything for fosters. And then it's an ongoing communication with each foster about how the dog is doing, whether, whether it's ready for adoption. Usually it's 10 to 14 days. And right now I'm focusing a lot also on our Alito property, which is almost 15 acres in Alito. Right. And uh, we're breaking ground on the senior sanctuary this coming month. So that's great. And that will help us not only save more, but save more animals, but also save in term, save more animals by saving and vet bills because yeah. we'll keep them quarantined there 10 to 14 days and then they go to foster care to where we don't have as many that are worried about, you know, the animals sniffling and things like that. Uh, since in the last two years, things have really gotten worse. They, um, if, if a dog goes to the shelter, it's most likely going to either get really sick or be euthanized. Sure. Uh, the live release rate was 93% probably three years ago. It's, I would say 70% right now. Okay. And maybe even less. I haven't checked um, lately. Let's break that up a little bit because you talked about going to the shelters. Mm -hmm. And right now you're going to shelters and finding puppies, I, I believe. Is that right? For the most part, uh, folks own puppies with some of the foster, but then you yeah. brought up the seniors. So let's break that up for our audience. You, you go in because our, our shelters cannot hold the populations that come in, right? Right. And, and they can't properly you know, take care, care of all of them. Care for them, yes. sure, sure. So, and, and really we have over a thousand animals in our care, okay. all in foster care, uh -huh. which is like a shelter, Yes. but it's individual homes. Sure. And so they can properly care, make sure they get to vets right. and- And love on them. Right. right. And there's a lot of sickness going around right now. Okay. I don't know if you've heard about it, but influenza, which most vets don't even vaccinate for, is all of a sudden like, has a resurgence. I'm not sure why. And then uh, distemper, which yes. is super deadly. Sure. Um, parvo, you know, the, the sicknesses, and I think and if, uh, people are surrendering at an all high. Yeah. Um, but we take all dogs, it's based on our foster base. Mm -hmm. So if a foster is a senior foster, we have hospice fosters that sure. just want to get them out and give them even sometimes a few days, yeah. a few weeks, sometimes a few months. Um, and then we have puppy fosters. Okay. So there's for certain fosters, if I get a poodle, for example, I know who I call. Right. Um, and we have an adoption coordinator, a foster coordinator, a medical coordinator, you know, wow. several people that, um, I mean, we have hundreds of volunteers, which is great. And <laughs> <laughs> sure. I know. But, but that, so you, you'll find fosters and all, and then you brought up the senior center and I was at the event where a big fundraiser raising funds for that. And so that's really focused on older dogs and yes. giving them, as you said, it may be a few more days of life in a, in a nice right. environment, not in a cage, or it may be rehabilitating them in some way so they exactly. can be. Yeah, okay. So And yeah. some people you would be shocked adopt senior dogs. Sure. And some, we had a, one recently that had cancer mm -hmm. and this guy mm -hmm. adopted her, her name is Juno and she was fostered by um, a lady that works for Bank of Texas okay. and who's amazing and she I, I thought that dog was stuck with her and this guy wanted a dog that was yeah you know so they're terminally they're, ill all ranges there of are. people that and, and dogs that would be available maybe someone doesn't want a puppy that might oh, chew up their shoes sure. but they want yes. to care for something that's wonderful it's a balance what you've talked about this a little bit what's your favorite part about being involved in this sort of rescue care you know I've talked about this a lot lately I feel like it's the only thing and I never knew this to begin, you know, in the beginning, but it's an immediate reward. Mm -hmm. You know, so many people volunteer and you don't see that. I mean, you can recognize your difference in an hour. Sure. If you pick up a dog and the difference that dog is from the shelter to even the car, right. it's a smile versus facing the wall. Right. So it's, it's, it, we have transporters that just transport and it's because of that, it's a, it's a reward. Right and you can you know you're making a difference and with a lot of charities i think it's hard to see that and it's more long term you know to we, to where you're giving but you can't see it as quickly sure sure you can hold a puppy or hold oh a dog gosh, and yes. and understand and 
Um, you know, being in politics, people say if you really want a friend in politics, you, yes. get, you get a dog. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's Dogs true, are very... and I believe I believe that for sure. Yes. Uh, for sure, um, owning a pet's a responsibility, right? It, it is, yes. and you see around major holidays, people would buy them, um, but it is a responsibility, and people need to understand that. And, and that might maybe I don't know. Does that contribute sometimes to some yes. of the pets that you receive? It, we make it very clear with you know our foster guideline package, our adoption package, but you would be surprised about how many are uneducated and people that you wouldn't think. Um, we had one lady, you know, fostering, nicest person, but she thought vaccinated meant vaccinated once for their whole life. And, you know, that's a question for the foster app. Yeah. Are your dogs vaccinated? Right. That means yearly. Right. Um, and and you all provide those services for foster we care? We do for yet? foster care, yeah. but she was saying her dog was vaccinated. Uh -huh. And so education is huge. Yeah. Heartworm prevention, spaying and neutering, is absolutely mandatory. Right. People don't understand. I wish everyone could go to the shelter and right. see how many are there. One female can, in a lifetime can produce up to 67,000 offspring, unwanted offspring. Wow. Wow. I know, I keep being, yeah. I'm shocked by that number. And every time we have a, we have a graphic of it yeah. and it explains, you know, visually, but I still can't get my, you know, head wrapped around it. So. Right, right, that's a lot. You, you, that kind of care piece of it, making sure they have their vaccination, et cetera, is one sort of piece of advice. You have other advice for pet owners that are? Another huge thing is a lot of people, there are a lot of surrenders right now. Mm -hmm. And a lot are, I don't have enough time, I don't have the money, I don't have this. There are a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke to someone recently that called and said, we need to give this dog to you because he's too hyper. They were crating them during the day. And, you know, some things, you so know, is a money factor. Exercising. Yes, yes. Also, putting in a kennel is probably, I mean, it's, it's, it can be a good thing, but we have to realize that, uh, you know, they say a tired dog is a happy dog. Sure. You know, and a stimulated dog is a happy dog. So they started uh, using doggy daycare. Yes. Dog is a different dog. Oh, wow. Their household is calmer. So there's always, you know, just like a options. Kid. Yes. You got to wear the kid out. You so just they gotta, gotta, they gotta, and, and you just have to look at resources. Like, there's Don't Forget to Feed Me. They sure. give food to yes. people that. We've interviewed them before. Okay, yes. yeah. And they're wonderful. Great resource. Um, and, you know, even rescues, we've given a lot to people in need, especially if it's food. Boy, or right. if it's, even if it's an apartment complex that won't allow them, we'll call apartment complexes if they are really. But some, there's a lot. And I think. Um, so you have a lot of resources yes. to help people to get pets in homes, make sure they know how to care retention, for them. Retention and yes. retention yes. and spay and neuter. Okay. If, if, for example, we get calls, my, my dogs just had babies, can you help? And I said, if we spay and neuter the mom and dad, we right. can take the babies. Right. So a lot of times they want to keep the mom and dad and we're not opposed to that, but we cannot keep having, pop, babies. you know, babies right. and babies and babies. They're, they're euthanizing for the first time in years, they are euthanizing full-term pregnant moms and babies right we just saved one with two torn wow. acls that was being euthanized three months old wow there, there are a lot that are um and and i don't blame the shelter mm -hmm. but we have to start enforcing laws yeah. and and you know people want change they just don't know how to help make this change make a change. lot of its education and you know for example we have several cruelty cases we take two there's two, that, that there's warrants out for the arrest for right. these, you know, and it, they haven't been caught or right. arrested. So right. there's no accountability. Even if the laws are in, there, they're not enforced. Right. right. So, which is another huge problem with spay and neuter too. Sure. And so it's very complicated. Yeah, but very, very, very complicated. Well, Lauren, thanks for all that you're doing. Thank How you. can people find you? savinghoperescue.org okay. and they can email savinghopeorg at gmail.com and we would love volunteers especially at our new facility in Alito or even if it's towels, blankets, fosters, adopters, anything you can think of we're any we're need, open for it. Yes. Are those on your website too? People yes. can go and here's for how sure. I can help. Even if I can't foster an animal, I can give blankets, I can give Yeah, other there's things. always something someone can do. Sure. And transporting even a dog from a house to a vet yes. and then take it back. I mean, there's 
tiny things that th th take 30 minutes, but it makes a difference. Definitely. So. Well, thanks again for all you do, and thanks Thank for being you. with us today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Now I'm here with Lauren Richard, who's president and CEO of Campfire First Texas. Welcome, Lauren. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. Thanks for, for being here. So Campfire First Texas, I think people have heard of it, but, mm -hmm. but may not know exactly all the services that you provide. Tell us a little bit about the organization. Sure. So I think most people know us um, originally as Campfire Girls. Yes. yes. Um, Bluebirds back in the day. Yes, yes. Um, and today we have morphed into primarily um, after school and out of school time programming um, for children and youth, both in schools and at our camp out in Granbury, Texas, yes. Camp El Tesoro. Yes. Um, but we also work with early childhood educators. Okay. So one of the ways that we scale our impact um, is by working with educators who then work with hundreds of other children. Okay, um, okay. So. And what do they do when they, what's the interaction that they have with them in that, in that With case? the teachers? Yes. Yeah, so um, we have an early education apprenticeship program which is brand new. Okay. It's okay. backed by the Department of Labor and it's really um, intended to help elevate the field of early childhood. Okay. Um, and help uh, educators kind of do an earn as you learn okay. program. Um, so one of the barriers to becoming obviously an early childhood educator and retaining them is wages. Okay, um, yes. And we also want to increase the quality and we yes. increase the quality by training the teachers. The training the teachers. Yeah. And that's something that I think that's interesting for people to know. I know the numbers floated out there from childcare of sorts that a Bucky's employee makes more than most right. average childcare that's right. here in, in Tarrant County. Um, and also this fact that for a long time, and even when I was growing up, kindergarten was pretty new. I mean, you did maybe half day and then right. and et cetera, and that expanded to full day kindergarten. Now we have pre-K, right. but there's been a lot of emphasis on this zero to six, like really focusing on mm -hmm. that you learn more is this in zero to six. Your brain soaks up so much during that. So Absolutely. giving that education to them, I, I think would be important to the, right. the educators, right? Of, right, of, and that's of, one of the things I think that differentiates Campfire is we really focus on those two um, times of really explosive brain growth. Which is zero, zero to six, six uh -huh. but also early adolescence is another right. time when your brain is just making so many connections. Right. Um, and so we work with teens as well. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've got, I've got two teenagers right now and there's a lot of hormone explosion. There's a lot going on up there. There's a <laughs> lot going on up there. That's right. Well, you mentioned, I think this is a special thing to Camp El Tesoro. All three of my daughters have gone out there yes. during their summer program, but tell us a little about that for people that don't know, because you do things here in Tarrant County. I mean, That's and right. then Camp El Tesoro, what, what's special about that? Um, camp is one of the most special parts of us. Yes. Um, we have a 200 acre camp out in Granbury, Texas, and um, we provide um, resident camp, day camps, uh, grief camp for kids who have lost a loved one, and then we also do outdoor education groups for um, schools. Sure, sure. What's um, your favorite part of, of the camp? Oh gosh, so many things. Um, I think it's, you know, we talk a lot about finding the spark at Campfire and yeah. thriving. Okay. And that, those are the two things that really, you know, I don't know, growing up, I didn't really have teachers talking to me about like, what's your spark? What's your- So like being aspirational. Yeah, yeah. Like what's your gift? What's your, what are you interested in? Like nurturing that, helping right. them figure that out. Um, and camp is a great place to do that. And uh, how many years has that camp, I mean, if how, lo how long has that camp been? Well, we, we were founded in 1914. Okay. Um, and that was a staple from the very beginning where it's some yes, of these camps. Yeah. Okay. My, my girl's favorite part is the stick at the end. Yes, that you get. the walking stick. The walking stick, I think after three, three years. Three years, and mm -hmm. then you, you can pass it on and, and bring it back. Right. When, we, when I greet families coming in, I always know if they're returning or not, if they have a stick in their hand when they come up. Yeah. That's great. What, what do you think makes Campfire First Texas so special in North Texas? You know, I... I literally can't go a month without someone coming up to me or if, if I'm in a speaking engagement saying, you know, I was a campfire girl or I was a bluebird or I, had, I was speaking with Leadership Fort Worth recently and one of the attendees said, you know, my, my brother really wanted to go to camp, but it was all girls and then y'all integrated. We were one of the first ones to go co-ed. Wow. And she's what year was that? So, do you remember? That what? was in the 50s. In the 50s. Wow. Yeah. So very early in, in that. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And so she, you know, she said that he had that experience and we were able to share it together. and. So um, I think we, we're always trying to be responsive to the needs of the community. Sure. When you've been around for a hundred years, you know, you have to continue to iterate and, and really adapt. adapt. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I think has been most special about our organization and why we've lasted so long. That's, that's wonderful. What, what, do you have some special projects planned 
in, in upcoming in North Texas? Oh, yes, we Okay, do. let's tell us all about them. So our new um, early education apprenticeship program, we're actually taking that statewide. Oh, wow. Because during the pandemic, we figured out how to do virtual mentoring. Okay. Um, as well as um, education. Right. So we're serving, we actually serve a five county area. Right. Terrence, the most one, most one you know, people know about. Right. But um, we're, you know, we have uh, clients in our EAP program in San Antonio and in Glen Rose and all over the state. So we're working on expanding that and reaching as many educators as we can. Yes. We're doing really significant improvements to camp. Okay. Uh, we just uh, built a new lake last year. Okay. So the water, where, where, water in Granberry. In Granberry, okay. yeah. So yeah. we didn't have really any water activities. Okay. So now we do. Okay. Um, Wonderful. We are also building a new. It gets arts. hot out there in the it summer, gets so hot. that may mean something. It's hot. <laughs> Um, and we have a new arts village that we're building okay. so kids can explore their creative side. So okay. we're doing a lot of enhancements to the camp. Um, and then we're also... I know you've improved the dorms too. Where, oh where yeah, they stay. the cabins. Yeah. My, my daughters, the, the older daughters are very jealous when the younger daughter went and they like, we did not have this. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. not fair, right? That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then our Teens in Action program, okay. um, which has been really um, kind of beefed up by our new VP. She's really looking at college and career readiness. So okay. we help them find their spark and figure out what they want to do. Yes. But how do we get them there? How do you get them there? Yeah. So taking that, that next step. Yeah. Uh, one of the most fun events I attend every year is your Artist Christmas. Yes. Tell our viewers about that, how you source the art. We've got several art pieces in our home Good. Uh, from it that we, we love and end up end up using. I think I put one at, actually at the, our office too. So Wonderful. It's, it's great. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, yeah, it's our signature fundraiser. We um, we have artists from all over who come to, um, you know, showcase their art. Sure. And we have a panel that judges the art and decides who gets in. And then we do a, um, you know, best in show and that sort of thing at the event. Um, but it's really a fun evening sure. of, you know, great art great food really good company and for a really good cause and you know it's been going on for 30 plus years and people are still attending it in droves it's normally in the fall november yeah time november frame. november time november frame. yeah and then people can purchase the art right it's they can, a, yeah that's it's right auction, so that's yeah. right they can purchase the art um you know i've had some folks tell me they're like i don't have any more wall space yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're actually trying to um you know get new folks to come to the event that oh, haven't cool. been exposed to it before yes um, and a yeah. younger crowd too yeah. um, so it's been really successful well it's it's a great event i appreciate what you're you're doing um you've talked a little bit about this uh, i've got three daughters yes um but what advice do you give as part of this and, and i guess it's children in general but you know, mm -hmm. it's campfire texas just you talked about spark etc yeah what can you leave our viewers with about what's important about investing in children Oh, yeah. So I think after school time or out of school time really is sort of an under underrated sure. um, piece of how we help develop our kids. I mean, we're, we all, home, we're all focused we're all tired on, and that's every, right. yeah, we've got to cook dinner and do all these things. But right. We're focused on the school day usually yes. and what's happening there um, The the licensed educators have that covered. Right. You know, we are here to help with the rest of it. Right? right. We're here to help with social emotional learning. We're here to help with um, helping them find their creativity, find mm -hmm. what they like. Um, it's supposed to be a fun time, right? Right. right. Not a real highly structured time. Um, and so I would say, you know, go to our website. We have, you know, we have 10 locations um, for after school. Mm -hmm. We have 17 in action programs. Okay. We have four uh, day camps during the summer and then everything that happens at our camp. Um, but I would say also make sure that you're looking for licensed, licensed programming yeah. because right. a lot of after school sites are not licensed. And that's one of the other things that we're really committed to is being high quality. High quality. Do you pick the kids up from school or how do, how do the, they, or how would you, if, if, if a parent wanted to um, have after school activities, how would they, how would they engage? We do have a couple of buses okay. where we uh, bring kids to, okay. um, to the site, um, but we also do it at elementary schools. Okay. So they're already there. They're already there. Um, except for like some sites like Diamond Hill, which you mentioned sure. earlier. Yes. Um, yeah. And so, but yeah, we do do some transportation. I wouldn't say, you know, it's not, we don't have like so a it's fleet school, of buses. At the schools, at the <laughs> yeah. schools. Okay, yeah. good. Well, that, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for all you do for the community. Yeah. Really appreciate it. It's a great organization and I'm glad you're helming it. Great, thanks for having me. Of course, thank you. Surprise, thank you for joining us for this episode of Fort Worth Ford at Archie's Gardenland. Zach Galifianakis has his version of Between Two Verns. This is my version with the corn plant Dracaena here at Archie's Garden Land. Stop in, they can help you with all your needs. 
If you have ideas for our show, please share them with us. We love doing this for you, bringing great stories, great people, great organizations to tell you a little bit more about Fort Worth. Send us your ideas. We'd love to feature it if you keep watching. Thank you.